And what we will do today, and probably for the rest of today, maybe we'll go a little bit further, but we will look at an illustrative example. So we will solve one simple problem in excruciating detail and see how would you proceed about solving information design problems, what kind of is the what are the big ideas there, the big steps in the solution that you will use. An example will be as follows. So it is the example from the original Kamenitz and Getsko paper. And we have a, a story about a trial, a judicial process. So there is a suspect uh, who is accused of murder or any other crime that you like. The suspect is on trial. There is a judge who must decide whether to convict the suspect or to acquit the suspect. So to claim whether they, the suspect is guilty or not. And the judge wants to make the right decision. So the judge wants to convict the guilty suspect and to acquit the innocent suspect. Then there is the prosecutor. And the prosecutor is paid per cases one. So the prosecutor wants to convict our suspect regardless of guilt. So the, the choice here is that the prosecutor can call up a witness. And this witness will tell something about the suspect. You can think of a um, witness being in a, in a certain place on the night of murder, and where they are determines what kind of information they can tell about the suspect. Meaning, if the witness can confirm or deny that the suspect was very far away from the uh, place of the crime, then it probably says that the suspect is innocent. While uh, if we have a witness who was at the scene of the crime, and they can confirm or deny whether the, whether the suspect was at the scene of the crime or at the time of the crime, then it will be very kind of different kind of signal. Right? So this is the problem that we're facing. What I want you to do is to think about this for maybe five minutes and to frame this story into an information design problem. So just go back to the egg diagram and identify all the main elements that we're working with. Question one, who is our designer? It's the prosecutor. That's right. So the prosecutor designs what kind of witness to summon. So the prosecutor designs what kind of information the judge uh, will get and uh, the, the suspect will get about the suspect's guilt. So, good start. Then, who are the players in our case? The judge. And I, I guess it's, it would be too fishy to say, is there anyone else? Because only the suspect is left. But you're right in that the suspect is not actually a player in the game. So let's, uh, let us think about the actions that our players have. Because then it will be immediate why our judge is not, our, our suspect is not there. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So there is no action choice for the witness. We are treating witness as this experiment. So our witness is sworn to tell the truth, the full truth, and nothing but the truth about what they know. About what they know. So that's right. So, 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 so to repeat the point, uh, you can choose between different witnesses, and some of them might lie, some of them might not lie, and that is the kind of information you're choosing. Uh, yeah, th that is also a, a good way to, to look at it. But either way, we are taking witnesses as a given kind of, um, as having a given informational content. So we are not looking at their choice of how to report, but you can extend the problem by incorporating that as well, if they have any interest in, 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 in what's happening. Okay, so what are the actions of our player? Just very simple, they are already on the slide, right? Uh, convict or not, let's say, I, I will label these as to claim the suspect is guilty or not guilty. So we have, we have this decision of the judge that will depend on the information that we give the judge. 
in, on the experiment that we generate. And the reason we're not including the suspect in this game is because the suspect has no action in our game. So we do not care about uh, what the suspect does. Now, what is the state then of the world? The guilt of the suspect is either there or not. So you can more generally think about kind of the strength of the guilt of the suspect. Or, so you can think of different dimensions of guilt, but we'll just say that it is binary. And I will use the same uh, two letters to denote it. So the suspect is either guilty, state G, or not, state N. Cool. Let's go back to our players and the designer. We still need to define one part of the environment that is given to us in the problem, which is the utilities, the preferences, the utility functions. We'll use V1 to denote the player's utility, the judge's utility, so this is a function in of a and omega. How can we capture that? How can we capture this uh, utility function? What would be the reasonable, the reasonable utility function to assume? So let's say that this is an indicator function of whether action matches the state. So if the suspect is guilty and our action is to say the suspect is guilty, the utility is 1. Same as uh, if the judge correctly identifies the suspect is not guilty, and if the judge takes an incorrect verdict, then this equality is not there, so utility is zero. Okay. The question that I thought you were going to ask was, uh, what if this, this utility is asymmetric? So this utility can be asymmetric. For example, if the judge is more afraid of wrongfully convicting a suspect rather than letting a criminal walk free. In that case, we would not have 0, 1, 1, 0, but we would have some different pair function. So either one of the zeros would not be 0, but something negative, or one of the ones would not be 1, but something uh, different than 1. But we will assume for simplicity that uh, the judge is unbiased in this dimension. And the judge always wants to yeah, do the right thing. Now, what about our designer? We will denote the prosecutor's utility function as v0. Again, we will write it in general form as depending on a and omega. And so how can we model this? Yeah, he gets positive utility if the suspect gets convicted, if the suspect is uh, declared guilty, regardless of the state. So we can write this as um, getting utility 1 if action is g. And you see that this utility function is actually independent of, of the state. So we could write it as just V0 of A. And this will be somewhat important in our analysis, and it will be important in one of the general approaches that we will use. So just to be clear about the timing in this problem, I think that you all get it quite well by now. But the timing of the problem is as follows. So first, the prosecutor chooses the witness, chooses mu and commits to this mu. So the prosecutor announced what kind of witness they are summoning, so everybody then knows what will be the distribution of signals. Then, basically the state w omega is determined. I guess not in this problem, state was determined long ago, but then kind of the, the witness uh, comes up to the, to the stand and reveals their message, which reveals some information about omega. So you can erase step two in this problem. It's not the state is never observed by anybody. So the witness reveals some message to the court, and this gives everybody some information about the state. The judge, in particular, observes this message and updates uh, their belief about the state. The judge then takes the decision to maximize their expected utility, and finally, all payoffs are realized, and uh, the suspect is convicted or acquitted. And this is the problem that we will solve right now. I have not told you what the prior belief is of the judge. But it's good to write it down. So prior phi 0. Additionally, the binary state will shape this prior in the sense of this being the probability of one of the states. So let's say this is the probability of state G. So we have this kind of dynamic game with, with a few different stages. 
we do it, we, we solve this problem the way we usually solve all of our dynamic problems by backwards induction. So we start from the end and we go back in time throughout this problem, just identifying pre earlier and earlier sets. So, as I told you, we want to start from the end. And the very final decision that is made in our kind of game is the judge's decision on whether to convict or to acquit the suspect. The judge wants to, as we said, maximize the expected payoff. And we will call the optimal action rule, the optimal decision rule, a hat of phi. So phi is the belief that the judge will have about the state of the world, about the guilt of the suspect. And given this belief phi, which will in general be different from the prior because some extra information was revealed by the witness, given this belief phi, the judge will select some optimal allocation a hat. So this should be the maximizer over all actions of the expected utility. So the expectation over state of V1 of A omega condition on phi. So this is the abstract way to write this. Now let's plug in our things. So how does this expected utility look like? So you can write it as, as cases, uh, but since it's kind of simple enough, I'll just write it in one expression with indicators. So if uh, action is G, the expected utility is phi, that's exactly right, because then you get utility of one if the state is G, which happens with probability phi and zero otherwise. And if the state is, if the action is N, then the judge receives utility one only if the suspect is not guilty, what happens with probability one minus phi. And then what is the maximizer of this expression? What is the optimal action? So first of all, it's strictly optimal to play G if phi is strictly greater than one half. It's strictly optimal to play N if phi is weakly small, is strictly smaller than one half. If phi is exactly one half, then the judge is indifferent. And in this particular problem, we do actually want to put our finger on the exact tie-breaking rule. And Johan is right in that we want to have the weak inequality here. We want the judge to play the prosecutor favorable action in case of indifference. And this is the general uh, assumption we make in information design models that if our players are indifferent, then we are selecting the designer preferred thing. So let us take a look at the prosecutor's utility. Our prosecutor is once again designing this experiment, right? This experiment affects the judge's belief, phi. So we are thinking of the prosecutor who wants to manipulate phi. But our utility function for the prosecutor, the v0, was in terms of action and not the belief of the, of the judge. But we can fix that because this judge's optimal action exactly tells us, well, what the optimal action will be, what the judge will do with a given belief. So we will introduce this kind of uh, reduced form utility, big V0 of phi. And we will say that this is the prosecutor's utility when the judge has this belief phi, posterior belief phi, and takes the optimal action a hat. So a hat of phi. And as we said, V0 does not really depend on the state, and that is kind of where we use it. So we use it to get to this mapping, to make sure to get the prosecutor's utility function that only depends on belief phi. And now we can calculate this big V0. So we can write it as the indicator function of phi being weakly greater than one half. The prosecutor gets utility one if he gets to induce the posterior belief above one half weakly and zero otherwise. Cool. So this is the utility function that we're going to work with. So the claim I want to make is that by choosing experiment mu, the prosecutor is effectively selecting a distribution tau over posterior beliefs. So just to decipher this object, omega is our state space. Belief of the prosecutor phi is a distribution over states. And the prosecutor is 
designing distribution over beliefs. So distribution over distributions over states. And what I want to say, so the reason I'm emphasizing this connection, is to say that we can forget about the problem of choosing the experiment. We do not care about what exactly the message will be and with what probability this or that message will be sent. Because we can focus on this problem. This is what matters. The posterior beliefs are what matters. So we will focus on the problem in which the prosecutor is choosing this distribution over posterior beliefs. So once again, we started with saying, you know what the prosecutor does? Well, selects a witness in our case, but in general, the prosecutor designs this experiment. What the experiment does is it maps states into distributions over messages. I, we have one player, so there is no power N here. So distributions of messages for the, for the judge. But these messages can be anything. So the experiment also selects this set M. And it's the same story as we had in mechanism design. In general, you can select any mechanism you want in a given environment. You can design any game you want. But truth is, there is this revelation principle. So you do not need to look at the set of all possible games. You only need to look at direct revelation mechanisms in mechanism design, right? That specific class of games in which players report their types truthfully. This is the similar revelation principle for information design. So what it says is that you do not need to look at the set of all possible experiments mu and m. You only need to look at the sets at experiments which are such that uh, basically they tell the judge the belief that the judge must have. So this is not quite the revelation principle, but I'm saying you that the we can use this kind of revelation principle which says that this M is the set of posterior beliefs. And our experiment mu will tell the judge, you know, in this state, your belief will be this with this probability and this with this probability, and so on. So we can use posteriors as messages. This is the bottom line. This is the takeaway. So what's the difference between this kind of revelation principle that I verbally stated and this problem of selecting optimal posterior top? Well, the difference is that this distribution so far is anything. It's just a distribution over posteriors. This experiment is a mapping from states to basically distributions of posteriors if we're using beliefs as our messages. So you see that these are the, what I said is not, does not correspond perfectly to what I wrote. This mu would tell you uh, would be a collection of tau's conditional on states. So the mu, the whole experiment, is a collection of tau well, conditional on omega for all possible states omega. So I'm making another leap of faith here, saying that you can forget about this condition and you can just try to select an unconditional distribution of posteriors. So this is a big jump. I realize now that I should have framed it more carefully. But my claim is, let's, let us try to do this now and argue that what we did was the right thing later. So let us pretend that the prosecutor can select any distribution of our posteriors, tau. What would, or what kind of beliefs would the prosecutor then select? Or what, what kind of distribution would the prosecutor select in that case? So let's put this under three, the prosecutor's problem. The number in a force does not coincide with the slides, uh, but I'm, fo I'm following broadly the same, the same steps. So if prosecutor can select any, even speaking simpler, any posterior rather than distribution of posteriors, our prosecutor would want to select phi greater than one half. So more generally, any distribution 
that assigns only positive weights to posteriors above one half is optimal for the for the prosecutor. So the question is, is this if an unreasonable if? So let's start by saying it depends on the prior. It depends on the prior belief that the judge had. So let's start with a simple case. Suppose the prior belief was weakly above one half. Then, as Johan has already pointed out, the optimal thing to do is to do nothing. Even if we do not summon any witness, if we do not provide any extra information to the judge, they will convict the suspect, which is the desired outcome for the prosecutor. So it is optimal to do nothing. Or it is optimal to select a degenerate experiment, which assigns probability 1 to the prior. Now, OK, so the question to test how, how much you uh, understand of what's going on. Can the prosecutor select an experiment that would induce a degenerate belief at somewhere other than phi zero? So suppose phi zero is one half. Is phi equal to three quarters with probability one a, an acceptable experiment? A feasible experiment. So we are looking at the prosecutor selecting distributions of our posteriors and we are now trying to figure out what distributions are available to the prosecutor. So this is the question connected to that. Would this distribution be available to the prosecutor? So if I start by believing that something has a chance of 50-50, right, and then for sure I know that my belief will raise up to three quarters. Then I know that I will learn something with probability one that will shift my belief there. Then why is my initial belief not at three quarters already? Right? So beliefs must be rational. The judge must have correct beliefs on average, meaning that this is not correct. And the only distributions tau that are available to, to the prosecutor are such that this plausibility or Bayesian consistency condition holds. I will not write the sentence, I will just write the condition. So the expectation of my posterior belief over different posterior beliefs that I can have in the end must be equal to my prior belief. You can think of it as the law of total probability. So, for example, if there are two possible messages, then this expectation can look as a, a posterior one with some probability tau one plus posterior two with some probability tau two. This expectation must be equal to phi zero. And this tau two will be just the complementary probability, so one minus tau one. Right? So, for example, if my belief if I can receive some bad message, which will bring my belief down, I don't know why it's a bad message, but if I receive some message that will bring my belief down, then after another message, my belief must go for the average to be at phi zero. So the question is, why is this the right notion for rationality of beliefs or rationality of expectations? And this is this, the standard assumption that we make in, in economics, in economic models that all of our agents' beliefs are rational. But this is more or less the definition of it. It says that beliefs are correct on average. So the way we usually perceive it is that my belief about uh, the states of the world must correspond to the actual distribution of the states of the world. Here it's slightly more sophisticated, right? So my belief over the distribution of my own posteriors must coincide with the actual distribution of my own posteriors. You see, the idea is the same, it's just the object is different. So, why did I tell you about this Bayesian consistency? I think I did not motivate it properly, and that's part of the reason why 
why it's so mysterious still. The reason is um, we know that if prior belief is above one half, then it's optimal to send a degenerate experiment. But we do not really know what is the optimal thing to do if uh, the prior belief is below one half. And the point that I kind of led to is that in this case, if the judge's prior belief is sufficiently tilted toward the suspect being innocent, not guilty, then it is not possible for the prosecutor to induce posterior above one half with probability one for exactly this reason, because beliefs must be rational. So the judge knows that the suspect is innocent with sufficiently large probability, meaning that with some probability the suspect will have to be acquitted, let free. Suppose that the prosecutor chooses a binary experiment. So a witness will either confirm or deny that, this, uh, that the suspect is guilty. But the probabilities of these conditional states can be can vary. So suppose we are choosing two different posteriors. Uh, so let the experiment be binary. Meaning that posterior phi will be will take one of two values, phi one or phi two. Now we already have this Bayesian consistency requirement. We know how phi one, phi two, and the probability of the two are connected together given the prior phi zero. So we can write down the prosecutor's problem as follows. The prosecutor wants to maximize the expectation with respect to tau of their of uh, his v0 phi of the posterior phi and this posterior phi is random with the distribution tau so it's either phi 1 or phi 2 and it's phi 1 with probability to 1 right so the posterior wants to maximize this expected utility subject to a bunch of constraints Firstly, Bayesian consistency. We already argued that this is an important constraint. I will refer to it as constraint star. So we need to include this as a constraint. Now, when, when we think that the experiment is binary, what would be the optimal thing to do? So we know we cannot have both of these priors be above one half. If we think about both of these priors being below one half, this is something we can do, but it makes no sense for the prosecutor, because then the suspect walks free for sure after any of these. So for now, what we argue is that it's optimal for one of these posterior beliefs to be above one half weekly and another one below one half strictly. So we will have these domain constraints here. Suppose that phi one, I think, is below one half. And not even below one half, but we also know it will be below phi zero by again Bayesian consistency. We have one posterior that goes up, so another posterior must be below the prime. And then phi two is from one half to one. This is the problem that we need to solve, and I planned on doing this a little more explicitly. But I will not do that now. So one thing I will tell you that this expected utility can be written quite simply. So this is something that you can do. If you remember, this v0 of phi was the indicator that phi was weakly greater than one half. Right? Rings a bell. The prosecutor gets utility one if the subject is convicted, which happens if phi is weakly greater than one half. So given this structure of the experiment, this expectation will just be equal to the probability of having a posterior above one half, which in our case is one minus tau one, by the way we have constructed our experiment. So you can calculate this expectation on your own at home. By the way, just one uh, point of caution that I would like to make is that 
we should always keep track of what are you expecting over. So what do these expectations mean? Because here it is over tau, over different realizations of the posteriors, right? At some previous point, we had expectation over states. So always keep track of what your expectation is, what distribution are you expecting with respect to. So the bottom line is that the prosecutor wants to maximize this probability of posterior phi 2 subject to these three constraints. And as Yepe has correctly uh, mentioned, this solution will be to have phi 1 equal to 0 and phi 2 equal to 1 half. So we will not derive it, but let us discuss why exactly does this happen on the intuitive level. So let's say that we have that this is our axis of beliefs from 0 to 1. 0.5 is somewhere here. And we have phi 0 somewhere here. What is our prosecutor's utility, the designer's utility, big V0? We know that it is 0 below 1 half, and it is equal to 1 above 1 half. Now, how can we depict experiments in this graph? This is kind of the hardest part. So we must pick two points, two posteriors phi, or maybe more in principle, but two will be sufficient, such that they are on different sides of phi zero. This is something that will be required by Bayesian consistency. Right? Once again, if you have good news, then some news must be bad. So suppose that this is phi one and this is phi two. And what you know is that these phi one and phi two must average out together to phi zero. So what this means here is that fix phi one, the further away you move phi two to the right, the lower is the probability that you will have to assign to phi two. So the smaller is the probability with which you will be able to induce this posterior belief. In that, with that logic, it kind of makes sense that you want to, since you want to induce phi 2 as frequently as you can, you want to actually push it to the left so long as it's, as it's still above 1 half. Therefore, 0.5 is indeed the optimal posterior uh, phi 2, is the optimal phi 2 to choose. On the other hand, now you have fixed phi 2. What about the optimal phi 1? The same reasoning. The further phi 1 is to the left, the lower is the weight that you put on phi 1, and the larger is the weight that you put on phi 2. Therefore, you want to maximize the weight on phi 2, so you push phi 1 furthest to the left. So in the end, our optimal experiment will mix between belief 0 and belief 0.5. So either the judge will be perfectly sure that the subject is innocent and must be let go, or the judge will be on the brink of convicting the subject. Right? The judge will be very unwillingly, but begrudgingly, but they will still say, I'm convinced barely enough that the subject is guilty, so I want to convict the subject. And this is what the prosecutor wants, right? So the prosecutor wants to be there to be as many convictions as possible which means making the judge as uncertain as possible in the, subject, in the subject's guilt, so long as conviction still happens. And so vice versa. If you have to subject be let go sometimes, just make it be absolutely clear that the subject is innocent, because it gives more weight to the other's realization of the, of the, of the world in which the subject is convicted. So what kind of witness would, we, would uh, represent this distribution of our posteriors? Uh, it is a kind of witness which could either clear the subject completely or could uh, not provide any definitive, definitive evidence. So you can think if um, the scene of the crime was uh, in some nightclub, then we can call up a witness who was in some park 
at the same time half a uh, city away from, from the nightclub where the crime occurred. So if our witness will say that they saw the suspect there at the time of the crime, given an alibi, this will clear the suspect perfectly. And, uh, bring the judge's belief to here. Conversely, if this witness will say, well, yeah, I was half a town away from there and I did not see anyone, including the suspect. Then it is bad news with some probability. So the judge's belief will jump up here. So it's optimal to summon a witness who is not immediately relevant to the case, who cannot confirm guilt, but can provide an alibi. You would think it is optimal thing to do for the lawyer, for the defendant, but it is actually optimal thing to do for the prosecutor here. 